Ladies and gentlemen, today's video topic is to be able to identify which method is going to be able to solve a quadratic equation as easily as possible. This video is not intended to be an introduction to all of these uh, methods to solve a quadratic equation, but it should serve as a very good review. So while I will be doing many examples and showing you how to do each one of these methods, the main purpose of this video is to figure out which method is going to serve you best when you go to solve one of these equations. So without further ado, the next slide here has a flowchart that can help you decide which method to choose when. I would highly encourage you to take a screenshot of this flowchart because it's going to be very useful for you for the rest of this video. And specifically on the next slide, I'm going to ask you to put the flowchart into action and decide which method would work best uh, for each quadratic equation that I'm going to show you. So the way this thing works is the earlier you can ditch out of this flowchart and actually go do the problem, the easier time you're going to have. The first step is to simply get all your terms on one side and combine all like terms. So set the equation equal to zero and combine all like terms. That way you should get a uh, equation with an x squared in it uh, set equal to zero and up to three terms involving that. You should be able to easily identify an a value, a b value, and a c value from your equation. Step number two is trying to determine whether or not it's most easily solved through square roots. And the way to figure that out is if it's missing this middle term. And you can see if we have an ax squared plus c, that bx term is not there. Or if that x squared, that thing being squared, is slightly more complicated, like there's an expression inside of it, and you still have a constant added on and equal to zero, uh, both of those equations would most easily be solved by square roots. So if you can identify missing bx term um, in either case, that's ideal. There's also a very special case of this where you have a perfect square, perfect square, minus a perfect square, uh, and that can be done, that can be solved using factoring or by square roots. Your choice, some people find that factoring is a little easier than solving by square roots. The next step in the flow chart is whether or not you have a c value. So you can see in this equation, the c value, the constant term, the term with no variable is missing. And in that case, both terms have a, an, a variable in them, so you can factor that variable out and you can apply the zero product property from there. Uh, step number four is when you have all three terms, and there are kind of two cases to break down here, so we're trying to look at a trinomial now, and we're trying to factor that. Um, if there is an a term of exactly one, it's kind of an easy method where you're trying to pick two numbers to go in these slots uh, that multiply to be c and add up to be b. Um, if there is an a value, then things get a little more complicated, but you can either do a guess and check, or I'm going to show you a little trick called the asterisk method to help you take fewer guesses in doing that. And finally, if none of the above work, um, then the last resort uh, for most people is to use the quadratic equation. And I say it's the last resort because usually for a lot of people, the quadratic formula is quite complicated, and there's a lot of opportunity to make an error. So if we can factor it using a simpler method above, then uh, you'll probably have an easier time with it. So that is the flowchart, and now we want to put the flowchart into action. So on my next screen, I'm going to show you uh, a good number of quadratic equations. And what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video right here, and I want you to label each problem with the type of method that you would use. So put in SQ if it's a square root problem, a GCF if you're just removing a GCF, an F for factoring, and a Q for quadratic. So use that flowchart and label each one of these problems with one of those letter or letter sequences to, to determine as best you can uh, which method you're going to use on each one. And if you can't get one or two, that's fine. Just go ahead and complete them as best you can. Pause the video here and do that. Here are the correct answers. On the first one, you can see that it's a trinomial. Uh, but if you try to factor that, that is, think of two numbers that multiply to be 1 and add up to be negative 4, well, there aren't any two integers that do that. So uh, that means that uh, since we're already on, like, step number 4 in the flow chart, then we have to go to step 5, which is to use the quadratic. So it's unfactorable, uh, and you have to use a quadratic. The next one, you can see that you are missing a bx term, and you have this quantity being squared. So instead of foiling that out, uh, it's easiest just to use square roots to solve this equation. Divide by 2, take a square root, and go at it. Uh, the next one is another trinomial, so there's no terms missing, so we're not in step 2 or 3. Uh, it is factorable in this case, it takes a little bit of work, but it is factorable. Number 4 here has only two terms. You'll notice that it's the c term that's missing, so both of the terms have an x, and you could factor out an x to solve that. Number five is factorable, 
through the simple method. There it is, all factored up for you. Number six, you could choose to use uh, square root or factoring. You'll notice that it has only two terms. The B term is missing, but you'll also notice that it is perfect square. And if you were to get things equal to zero, it would be perfect square minus perfect square, a difference of perfect square binomials. So that one is indeed factorable, or you could do square root. It really doesn't matter which one you choose. Number seven is probably the most complicated one I ask you to do, which requires you to get things set equal to zero uh, by subtracting a 6x squared and then removing a GCF of 3. When you do so, the remaining trinomial that's in there is also factorable. So this one's totally factorable. It just takes several steps to do so. This next step, uh, if you combine all like terms, you will only have two, two terms and the B term is missing. So this one's solvable by square roots. Uh, number nine, is once you get everything over to one side and you remove a GCF of 5, you can attempt to factor that all day long, but there are no integer answers to this one. So this one is best solved by using the quadratic formula. And there is no real way to do that, to figure that out short of just trying it. So if you said factoring or quadratic or just resorted to the quadratic, that's a reasonable answer to that. And lastly, we have another one that once you set it equal to zero, it's easily factorable. If at this point in the video you feel pretty confident on how to solve a quadratic equation by using square roots, GCFs, factoring, or the quadratic formula, and you are confident on how to identify each type of equation, you're done with the video. You can skip out the rest. But if you'd like to review on how to do a few examples of each type, I'm, I have like 10 or 11 examples that I'm going to run through uh, and explain to you how I would have chosen to do each one and then I'm going to show you how to do each one. So use the annotations to skip ahead to the appropriate time marks in the video. Without further ado, here's our first one. Uh, this is problem A. You'll notice that if you set things equal to zero, you have a missing BX term, which means you can solve this by using square roots. So I'm going to, as a first step, add 15 to both sides. Uh, then we want to just follow the reverse order of operations or the order use inverse operations to undo them. First, undo any addition or subtraction, which we just did, then undo any multiplication or division, uh, which we'll do by dividing by three on both sides, and then we'll finally save the exponent for last. Basically, we want to isolate the thing being squared until our very last step, and then finally take a square root of both sides and express both the positive and the negative square root. Remember that every time you take a square root, it should result in a positive and a negative answer. Our next example is very similar. We have something being squared, except this time the thing being squared is more than just a variable. It's an expression. But we're going to treat it basically the same thing. We're going to isolate the item being squared entirely before we take a square root. We're going to do so by first undoing any addition or subtraction. So we see subtraction there. So we're going to add 650 to both sides, then divide by 10 to get rid of the 10. And then at this point, the thing being squared is isolated. So we are free to take a square root there. You might say, oh, well, 65 isn't a perfect square, but that doesn't stop it from having a square root. It'll be an irrational number, which here I'm going to round to the nearest hundredth. And we have to express both the positive and the negative version of it. So uh, we use this little symbol plus or minus, and that just shortcuts us having to write out positive 8.06 and negative 8.06. Uh, but we're not done with the equation because we don't have our variable completely isolated either. So in this case, we need to split this, ex this equation right here into two separate equations, one with a positive 8.06 and one with a negative 8.06. So we need to examine both cases so as their own equations. So you notice that the equations are very similar with the exception of this negative sign versus a positive 8.06. Then just solve them by subtracting 5 from both sides on both equations, and you'll end at answers of 3.06 or thir negative 13.06. The next problem we have for you today, you can see again, it's missing that BX term, so you'd be free to solve this by using square roots. But more specifically, you'll see that 9x squared and 16 are also perfect squares, and there's a subtraction symbol in between. So this is a very special case of uh, difference of squares binomial, which is factorable. So if you're comfortable with factoring, you can factor it into 3x plus 4 and 3x minus 4. If you wanted to solve it by square roots, you can do that too. But it, since it was solvable by factoring, I figured I'd show you an example of that. Um, at this point, we have two items multiplied together equal to zero, so we can apply the zero product property, which states that if you have multiple things multiplied together the, and their product is zero, then one or all of them have to be zero. So 
Uh, we're going to write two separate equations that say this thing is equal to zero and that thing is equal to zero and solve each of them separately. So uh, on the left hand one we're going to subtract four, on the right hand one we're going to add four, and then we're going to divide by three to get uh, four thirds and negative four thirds. Our next example you can see again only has two terms, but this time it's the c term that's missing, and both of our terms have a variable in it. So in this case we can factor out an x, and if you could factor out an x and a number you would want to do that at this point. And you'll notice now we have thing one times thing two, so we can again apply the zero product property to solve this equation. Uh, so we want to set that thing equal to zero and that thing equal to zero in their own separate equations and solve them if necessary. The one on the left is already solved, so all we have to do is add eight on both sides to the one on the right, and we get solutions of zero and eight. So you can see now in example E, now we have finally a situation where we have all three terms present set equal to zero. So this is one that we're going to try to factor. Uh, this is a situation that we would want to attempt to factor because it'll be easier than using the quadratic equation. So in solving a trinomial, we want to pay attention to whether there's an A term here or not. Uh, there is an A term, but it's exactly one. So in this case, it's the easier, easier situation where all we have to do when figuring out our binomials is we need to think of a pair of numbers that multiplies to be positive 18 and adds up to be negative 9. Uh, without too much thought, you should be able to come up with that as negative 3 and negative 6. So notice that if we take these two numbers and multiply them together, we get 18. And if we add them together, we get negative 9. Um, if you're uncomfortable with factoring, I would highly suggest for the first bit of practice, check your answers by FOILing. So remember FOIL is an acronym just to help you to remember how to multiply out like this product. So we have binomial 1 times binomial 2. Um, FOIL stands for first, outer, inner, last. So we would take first terms, that's x times x to get x squared. Outer terms, x times negative 6 to get negative 6x. Uh, inner terms, negative 3 times x to get negative 3x, and negative 3 times negative 6 to get positive 18. At that point you would combine like terms and you'd see that we did that correctly and it matches the original. Back to our problem, uh, we now have two things multiplied together equal to 0, which means we can apply the zero product property, which again states that uh, if you have two things multiplied together equal to 0, that one or both of them needs to be 0. So we can write two equations separately to deal with each possibility, either x minus 3 equals 0 or x minus 6 equals 0, and solve each of those by adding 3 and adding 6 respectively to get solutions of 3 and 6. Next example f, where it is not set equal to 0, so let's fix that. Uh, we are not missing a term, so we're going to try to attempt to factor this. Okay, so when we try to attempt to factor, we want to remove any GCF that's present, and we want to make sure that our first term is positive. So we can see that our first term is positive, we're set equal to 0. Uh, and then we want to see if there is a GCF, and by looking at these you can pretty easily tell that the first term and the last term are divisible by 13, so if 91 is divisible by 13 that would be awesome, though it may not be immediately apparent. Um, ind indeed it is, so if you divide all those numbers by 13 you get the remaining trinomial to be x squared minus 7x plus 10, and that makes it easy in the same way that the previous two problems were just factoring with an a term of 1. So we're trying to think of uh, numbers in our binomials now that multiply to be positive 10 and add up to be negative 7. And it shouldn't take too much work to come up with x minus 5 and x minus 2. Again you can do a FOIL check to just verify that off to the side if you need to if you're not quite comfortable with factoring yet. And then we can apply the zero product properly, property like we did on the previous two problems. Set each expression equal to 0 and solve each of them for solutions of 5 and 2. Our next example, example G, is another trinomial. As you can see, at least you can once we set everything equal to 0, like so, just by adding 6 to both sides. You'll also notice that everything there is even, so we've at least got a GCF of 2, and it turns out that 2 is the largest GCF, so we want to remove that. Um, and again, assuring that our first term is positive, just to make sure of that. Um, and then we're going to try to factor this remaining bit here, but you'll notice that there is no further GCF there, and now we no longer have an a value of 1, instead the a value is 3. So instead of starting our binomials off with x and x, we need to start off our binomials with uh, a pair of items that multiply to be 3x squared. Now thankfully, there's only one possibility there. The only things that can multiply together to be 3x squared would be a 3x and an x. So immediately we know this much, that we need a 3x here and an x here, and then we need to figure out this number, which becomes a little bit challenging because 
that those two slots need to multiply together to be negative 16. And the problem is, is that negative 16 has multiple factors. It's got 1 and 16, 4 and 4, and 8 and 2, and then it's negative. So the negative can be on either one of those numbers. And the unfortunate thing is that whether we put the negative here or the negative there, or so let's say it was 8 and 2, we could put the 8 here and the 2 there, or vice versa. And all those different combinations matter when you would foil this out. So in essence, we just have to take a guess and then we have to check our answer. So the first guess that I'm going to take is we're going to go 8 and 2 on this one. So we're going to try a negative 8 in the first slot and a positive 2 in the second slot. And we want to just check our answer to see if we're correct. So by doing this, we've already assured that the first term is going to multiply to be 3x squared. So we don't have to check that. And we also verified that the last terms will multiply together to be negative 16. So we don't have to check that. So the only thing that we really have to check is whether the O, the outer terms, multiplied together and added to the inner terms multiplied together is going to line up and equal or combine together to be that magical negative 8x in the middle. So if we do that, the outer terms multiply to be 6x, the inner terms multiply to be negative 8x, and if you combine those like terms you get negative 2x, which does not match our original expression. So we're going to have to try again. So let's try a different pair of factors now. Let's try 4 and 4. Uh, if you do that, we get positive 8x as our combined middle term, which is again not a match. We want it to be an exact match. But notice that we're only off by a sign. So in this case, I'm going to swap the position of just the positive and negative. So let's try a positive 4 and a negative 4. And if we do that, we finally combine together to get correct the negative 8x that we wanted. At that point, we apply the zero product property, and we solve each one of those equations for solutions of negative 4 thirds or 4. Now, the method that we just used there, I'll refer to it as guess and check, worked fine. It worked well. We got our answer. We're all good. But there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of trial and error there. So there are tools that we can use to reduce the number of guesses that we can take. But they're all kind of gimmicky, and there's about a million and a half of them scattered about YouTube on how to factor a trinomial. The one that I'm going to show you today is the asterisk. And the asterisk method is it's a tool, it's a trick. It doesn't really teach you about how to factor and foil tri trinomials and binomials, but it is effective at reducing the number of guesses. So every once in a while, it's quite useful. So we're going to use it on problem number letter H here. And to start off, you'll notice that we have a GCF involved there, and our first term is not positive. So uh, in order to use the asterisk method, it requires that you remove a GCF. So you have to be really careful about that, and the first term always has to be positive before we can use this thing. So before we do that, we need to remove a GCF, and we need to, need to make the first term positive. Now, the reason I chose to use the asterisk with this problem and not the previous problem is because... Here we have a 10 and a 12 as our first and a last term. And the problem with that is that 10 has multiple factors and 12 has multiple factors and the negative throws in more possibilities. So in terms of our choices with guessing and checking, they increase exponentially with every single possibility uh, between factors of our first and our last term. So this cuts through a lot of those choices and gives us uh, the result faster. So again, it's a gimmick, but it works. So the way it works is you're going to take your A value times your C value, place it in that quadrant. You're going to take your B value, place it in that quadrant. And then there's two fraction bars off to the side here. So we have fraction 1 and fraction 2. And we're going to take the A value and whatever variable we're dealing with and stick it on top of both numerators. Okay, so we're going to draw an asterisk, and then we're going to populate it with all those numbers that we just talked about. So here we take 10 times negative 12 to be negative 20. Our B value is negative 7, our A value is 10, and we're dealing with the variable X. So that's how we would set it up. After setting it up, then your task is to figure out which numbers go on the denominator of the fraction. And you have to think of a pair of numbers that multiplies to be negative 120 and adds to be negative 7. So we're kind of doing that same what two numbers multiply and add to be these numbers, but we're arranging it in a way that's easier to think about. So uh, with a little bit of thinking, you can come up with uh, 15 and 8, the 15 being negative. And like I said, we want to view these as fractions, so we also want to simplify them as much as possible. So this one's divisible by 5, and the left one is divisible by 2. If you do that, you get fractions of 5x over 4 and 2x over negative 3. And once you have your simplified fractions, those become your binomials. So you can write it out fully factored, just like that, and then we can apply the zero product property and solve each of those equations.
If we had done this problem with guess and check methods, it would have been problematic because we would have had a lot of things to guess and check, whereas using the asterisk, you just cut through all those possibilities in one stroke. So again, it's a trick, but it's a helpful trick. The next example we have is seemingly ready to go. So uh, we notice that we have an A term uh, that's not one. We have a, there's no GCF, the first term is positive. So maybe try the asterisk method or just guess and check. But if you continue to do that, you'll know, you'll notice that there is no way to factor this thing into a set of integers. So we're gonna have to go, we're gonna have to go quadratic on this one. So we're gonna use the quadratic equation, which is something you should probably have memorized, just so you can pull it out at any moment and just use it without having to think too hard or look it up or spend that time. To use this formula, you have to identify your A value, B value, and C value, so you can populate that uh, with that. So nine, negative six, and negative 11 in this case. This formula only works when this is set equal to zero. So again, we would have done that in our flow chart anyways, but just to draw it out that you absolutely must have that equal to zero before you use this. Substitute in the values, and it looks super complicated. So if you try to type this into your calculator all in one go, you're likely to make a mistake. You, can, you might be able to do it, but you're uh, pushing your luck there a little bit. So maybe break it down into a couple easier chunks. Deal with the bit under the radical first, that is commonly referred to as the discriminant. Um, make sure that you're not making uh, any sign errors here too. So our B value was negative six and the formula calls for the opposite value of that. So there's a positive six there. Um, you also notice that negative six is being squared here. So we're gonna get a positive 36 right there. And then we have a negative four here combined with now our negative C value here. So we have two negatives being multiplied together. So overall, this term is going to be positive. Uh, and then down on the bottom, we just want to make sure that we fully evaluate our numerator and our denominator before we deal with this fraction bar. But as I said before, let's deal with this first. So we have 36 plus uh, some number here, 4 times 9 times 11, and that will get us 432 under the radical. Notice that also in the quadratic formula that there's a plus and minus there, that's how we get both of our solutions. So at this point, it'd probably be best to figure out what the square root of 432 is just by punching it in on a calculator. I'll round to the nearest hundredth here, so we get 6 plus or minus uh, 20.78 divided by 18 on the bottom. At this point, let's split it up into two expressions, one with a plus sign, one with a minus sign. Evaluate the numerator and then divide by 18 on each case there, and we get solutions of 1.49 or negative 0.82. Now, if your teacher or professor requires you to write things in simplest radical form, you would not want to round to decimals at that point. Instead, you'd want to deal with this square root of 432 here. Identify the largest perfect square factor that's present in there, which in this case is 144. So in other words, 432 is the same thing as 144 times 3. You can take the square root of 144. You can't take the square root of 3 nicely anyways. And then you can express the expression like that, 12 times the square root of 3 instead of the square root of 432. Finally, each of these items is divisible by 6, so you need to simplify that to get your fully simplified answer. And again, every teacher, every professor has different requirements about how you should express your answer, but know that both of these uh, answer expressions are exactly the same thing. Our final example today is another trinomial, and so it's not missing any terms, and it looks like we have an a value of 1, so you might be tempted to factor that uh, just by guess and check method. Uh, but there are no two integers that multiply to be 3 and add up to be 2. So um, instead, we're going to have to use the quadratic on this seemingly simple problem. So we try to do that. So we identify a, b, and c, and we plug in the numbers into the formula. We do all that work, and again, we deal with the discriminant first. Uh, if you do that, here's your issue right there, is that the discriminant is negative. So the item under the radical is negative, which means that when you take the square root of that negative, you're not going to get any real answers. You're going to get a complex number out of that deal. So if your course requires you to deal with complex numbers, you can do that. I'm not going to do it here. Um, or if your course doesn't have you deal with complex numbers at this point, you can just basically just say no real solutions or no solutions. Um, you can use this discriminant uh, check to determine the number of solutions with any quadratic problem that you do. So if you have the discriminant less than zero, you got no solutions. If it's exactly zero, you'll get one solution. And if you, it is greater than zero, that's where you're going to get two solutions. So uh, you can shortcut the quadratic just to check how many solutions you have. And if you're lucky enough not to have any solutions, then you can just end the problem there. That concludes this video. I'll see you next time.